you for joining us for the worship service today of Fresh Anointing Christian Center International. We are thankful that you were able to join us for the service, and we trust that you will uh, receive a word that is going to uh, encourage your heart. Um, but before we get into the word today, of course, um, we'd like to just share a scripture. And I'd like to share this scripture out of Psalm chapter 100, and it reads as follows. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations.
just start out with just reading the scripture um is colossians chapter 3 verse 12 in the niv <clears throat> it says therefore is god's chosen people holy and dearly loved clothe yourselves with compassion kindness humility gentleness and patience bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another and forgive as the lord forgave you and all over, put on these virtues of love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord God, um, just for this day, Lord God. I thank you, God, for just keeping us, oh God, um, as we slept, Lord God, last night. And Lord, we just thank you, God, for um, just this time, Lord God, spent together. We thank you, God, for the church ministry still being able to go on, Lord God, although we're not together. Um, I ask, Lord God, that you would just forgive each and every one of us, oh God, for the things that we have done, Lord God, that was not pleasing unto your sight, oh God. I pray, God, that you would just forgive us, Lord God. Point out us to us, Lord God, the things that offend you, oh God, the things that we're doing, Lord God, that is putting you to an open shame, oh God. Help us, Lord God, to be mindful of it, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, so we can change our ways, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. You said in your word, Lord God, for us to be transformed, Lord God, by the renewing of our mind, Lord God. So we ask, Lord God, that you would search our hearts, oh God, in the name of Jesus, and help us, Lord God, to know, Lord God, um, the, the, the things that are hidden, oh God, that we need to relinquish and give to you, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Um, Lord God, we just ask, Lord God, for just patience, Lord God, um, and endurance, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, especially in this time, Lord God, um, with one another, Lord God, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord God, our family members, Lord God, even on our jobs, Lord God, we just ask a special blessing, oh God, um, just for our, 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 our congregation, Lord. And Father God, we just ask, Lord God, that you would just um, touch each and every individual, Lord God, that is um, on the prayer line, Lord God, and um, on the church meeting, Lord God. We ask that you would just bless them, Lord God, meet them at the point of their needs, oh God. And Lord God, I ask that you would just um, touch each and every individual, Lord God, who is um, sick and shut in, oh God. You know who they are, Lord God. You know um, what they have need of, Lord God. You know the things, Lord God, that they may be struggling with, Lord God. We ask that you would just send a healing touch, Lord God, to each and every one of them right now, Lord God, at this very moment, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, for each family, Lord God, who has lost loved ones, oh God. We pray, I pray especially, Lord God, for the Rollins family, Lord God. I pray that you would touch them, Lord God, as only you can. Send a comforter, Lord God, right now to just come down, Lord God, and to be their peace, Lord God, and just shield them, Lord God, and wrap your loving arms around them right now in the name of Jesus, God. Lord God, we just ask, Lord God, for um, a, a special blessing, Lord God, upon our pastors, Lord God. I pray that you continue to rejuvenate them and replenish them, Lord God, of all that is going out, Lord God, from them, Lord God. I pray that you would give them favor, Lord God, give them grace, Lord God. Um, touch them, Lord God, mentally, Lord God, spiritually, physically, Lord God, whatever they have need of, Lord God. I pray that you would be, meet that need for them right now in the name of Jesus. Um, each each member, Lord God, of fresh anointing, Lord God, and even beyond fresh anointing, God, I pray that you will meet each and every individual at the point of their needs, oh God. And we pray, Lord God, for the speaker, Lord God, of the hour. I pray that you would just um, touch them, Lord God. Um, I pray that the word, Lord God, would just fall on good ground, Lord God, in our hearts, Lord God, and that it will produce fruit and their fruit will remain. Praise God. Praise God. He reigns. He reigns. He's in charge. Glory to the Lord. Glory to the Lord. Father, just have your way in the name of Jesus. Speak your word. Help me to speak your word, your truth in Jesus' name. Now, you know, many years ago, Pastor C did a message called Holy Ghost Terrorists. And as we closed down this year, you know, our theme was seizing the opportunity to be a loving community. As this year is coming to an end, the Lord is now calling us to be love terrorists or love warriors. So I'm calling this love warriors. Now, love is a healing force that builds, it strengthens, it serves people, it saves people. But love is also a spiritual force that creates terror in the hearts of the kingdom of darkness. Love is not just about warm feelings and teddy bears. Song of Solomon 8, 6 says that love is as strong as death. Love is a powerful weapon in the battle between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. It's a medicine to people, and it's, but it's an explosive weapon to the enemy. Now, stop seeing love as weak. We've been misunderstood. We've been... <laughs> tricked 
Love is not weak. It takes more strength to love than it does to hate because hate comes natural for you. It's in your sin nature. So it takes strength to love. Now, the word terrorism is defined as the calculated use of violence to create a general climate of fear in a population and thereby bring about a particular objective. That's what terrorists are. Jesus struck fear in the heart of the kingdom of darkness. Satan heard when God said in the garden to Eve that he was going to put hatred between him and the woman. He heard him. Genesis 3.15, the Lord says, I will put enmity between thee, talking to Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. How do you kill a snake? <laughs> Step on his head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. So the Lord heard, and the enemy heard what the Lord said. The word for bruise is to snap to overwhelm, to break, and to cover. So all through history, Satan is watching mankind for this seed of the woman that was coming to snap at him, overwhelm him, break him, and cover his head. So as soon as Jesus came on the scene, in Matthew, the clash of these two spiritual kingdoms started getting more obvious. In the Old Testament, the devil was called Satan, the old serpent, he had more subtle names. He kept a lower profile. You didn't see him as much. He was there, but he kept a lower profile. In Genesis 3.1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. The name devil literally means a slanderer, the arch enemy of good, and it means adversary. Now, Satan is called this because he slanders both God and humanity. He slanders and attacks the reputation with backbiting. He's a defamer, a detractor, and he belittles. In the word, there are 26 different names used for Satan. The title devil is not used until you get to the New Testament. For the first time, the term was used in Matthew 4.1. It says, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. A few chapters after that, in chapter 11, verse 12, it says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, one of the reasons Jesus was manifested was to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John in 3, 8 says it. He that committed sin is of the devil, and of, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, of course, Jesus came to save us. He came to set us free. He wanted to bring forth those sons and those daughters. But in order to save us, he had to destroy the works of the devil because at that time, mankind was sold unto sin. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he knew us before, he then did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wanted many, many sons and daughters. Jesus was the firstborn. Now, in Matthew 12, Jesus explains a kingdom principle. Matthew 12, 28. He says, but if I cast out devils, devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind this strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Jesus had to come to this planet and spoil and bind the strong man and destroy his works. Now, this was not some last minute plan that was thrown together. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit made the plan before the foundation of the world. Revelations 13, 8 tells us, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him 
whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Before Jesus spoke the world into existence, the God knew, Godhead knew what man was going to do. He knew what the serpent would do. Now, I wondered, I'm like, okay, Lord, you knew what was going to happen. Why did you go on with this plan? The Lord wanted a bride. He wanted some of my folks that were going to love him by free will. He could have said, oh, okay, no, let's back this up. No, that's not going to work. This one's going to mess up. That was No. He did not want a frigid, robotic wife. Nobody does. The Lord wanted sons and daughters who would serve him because of their love for him. He wants friendship, love, and loyalty from us. He wants service from us and affection. He wants folks that will lay down their lives for him. So the plan, the strategies, how the war was to be waged, the goal, the purpose, all of that was planned out before anything was created. They even knew that the last enemy to be destroyed was death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 tells us that. Now, a major part of this plan, obviously, was that Jesus chose to be the one to take on a body, come down, and execute a secret undercover mission for one this one big, last, destructive blow to the enemy. Now, Pastor C, in a message years ago, called it the resurrection uppercut. Now, an uppercut in boxing is a punch where you start down and you come up from the bottom and hit your opponent. And Jesus went down and he came up and he dealt the final blow to the enemy. Now, it had to be secret until this final blow. Now, Satan suspected something was funny about this Jesus guy from the beginning. There was a stir in the spirit realm. Okay, first you have this angel talking to Mary. You got another angel talking to Joseph. Satan heard the prophecy, so he decided, let me get rid of this Jesus guy right now. So he touched Herod to try to find out where this baby was. And, but unfortunately, Mary and Joseph fled the country of course, assisted by another angel. This all had to be kept secret. Now, if you think about it, Jesus could have come in and chosen a body where he was real buff and handsome and he was a prince and he was a giant. He was a superhero. He could have chosen to come to earth that way. But it was an undercover mission. Now, in Isaiah 53, 2, it says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. That means he wasn't fine. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't trying to bring attention to himself. The verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, from our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Matthew explained that this was one of the reasons that when Jesus spoke to people, he spoke in parables. Matthew 13, 34. All these things that Jesus spake, unto the multitudes in parables and without a parable spoke he not unto them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying i will open my mouth in parables i will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world paul also confirmed that this was an undercover mission in first corinthians 2 8 it says, listen to this, this is powerful, which none of the princes of this world knew, for he had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, Jesus could have come down real obvious. Okay, I'm God. I come to kick the devils behind. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. No, no, no. It was a secret mission. 
And the word prince is there. The princess, none of them knew about it. It means first rank in power, chief magistrates. Paul also called it the mystery that was revealed at a certain time. This is the New Living Translation in Ephesians 3, 3. He says, as I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed this mysterious plan to me. This is Paul talking. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to the holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news shall equally share in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are now part of the same body. Paul had to really help them understand. It's not just a Jews thing now. This is Jews and Gentiles that believe in Jesus. Both are part of the same body. Both enjoy the promises of the blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. He says, I was chosen to explain to everyone the mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was for the church to display his wisdom in his rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So it was a secret mission. The cross becomes that last atomic or nuclear bomb of love. They secured the victory of heaven and the kingdom of light. Everything God does, he does it according to the laws that he sets up. God sets up the law. Everyone else has to follow that law. He chooses to even follow the laws that he sets up. Now, he could have said, okay, uh, we're going to do the salvation another way. But he was the one that said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So that meant somebody had to shed some blood. He could have gone another way, but why did he do it this way? He wanted to model the ultimate love. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Colossians 1.16 in the New Living Translation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Talking about Jesus. He made the things that we see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Now, Jesus created all of these thrones and kingdoms in the spiritual realm. Now, Colossians 2, 14 and 15 tells us also in the New Living, a wonderful thing that happened. Jesus, talking about him, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Glory to God, glory to God. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. <laughs> Jesus spoiled principalities, spiritual principalities and powers. Powers there means translated in the original Greek. He spoiled their privilege, their force, their capacity, their competency. He spoiled their freedom, their mastery, their delegated influence. He spoiled their authority, their jurisdiction, their liberty, their power, their right and their strength. Hallelujah! Huh. Glory to God. And it says he made a show of them. That means he put them on display. In other words, that Greek word there means it's an acclamatory procession to conquer and show victory. In other words, they had a victory parade in the spirit realm. Hmm. Ephesians 4 and 8 says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Glory to God, glory to God. And his purpose was he gives, he gives out then those gifts who were the apostles, the prophets, 
evangelists, pastors, and teachers, that's verse 11, and the purpose was for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Final goal, till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Now, Jesus already set the fight up, fought the battle, won the battle. What are we supposed to do as love warriors? You don't have to come out swinging. You have to come out praying, praising, trusting, believing, and standing on the work that Jesus already did. You have to overcome evil with good. This is a whole different kind of way of fighting. First John 4, 16, for we have known and believe the love that God hath to us. God is love. He doesn't have love. He's not just a portion of, God is who love is. He is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Now, these are some of the behaviors of the love warriors. First of all, Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, sorry, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now, our natural human nature tells us somebody mess with us, they're going to get it. We are naturally prone to take revenge. The Lord says, no, no, no. Now you're a love warrior. Vengeance is his. He sees and knew before you even were born what they would do to you. Let him have his vengeance. Can't nobody get with somebody like God, honey. God can be all in their dreams and go from generation to generation all in their self. Can't nobody get back at somebody like God. So you take your hands off of it. And say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. So don't avenge yourself. Let the Lord repay. Romans 12, 20. This is another behavior of the love warriors. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Now, you know that's different. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. These are acts of kindness that you do for your enemies. What it does, it makes them ashamed. Even if they don't act like they're ashamed, it shames them. And then Romans 12, 21. Be not overcome by evil, but you overcome evil with good. Now, overcome means you subdue evil, you conquer it, you prevail, you get the victory with good. Conquering evil means you pumping up the good, honey. Now, your evil, which you have your sin nature, plus their evil only makes the devil happy. By not giving in to the dark side, <laughs> you fight it with good. This is a totally different way to fight. We are love warriors and we are love terrorists. Now, this is why worship is a weapon in the kingdom of God. This is our expression of love to God. It's passionate, it's freely given intimacy. I told you the Lord doesn't want a cold, frigid bride of Christ. Our worship stirs him. He stands up and he inhabits our praise. He's not excited about people just serving him out of duty, legalistic rules, and religion. Now that's fine. That's good. But Romans 12.1 says, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto him, holy and acceptable unto God. Listen, which is your reasonable service? You can't even get excited. That's what you just ought to do. He died to save you. You wouldn't be here without him. You wouldn't have breath or life. Those are just the reasonable things you do. The Lord wants a passionate love and a worship from us, which gives us power in his presence. Worship is a weapon. It is our way of saying to the kingdom of darkness, we don't care what it looks like. We believe that our God reigns. He has won the victory. We are more than conquerors. Just like the Hebrew boys that said, even if he doesn't deliver, we're still not going to bow. Now, if you've ever been around demon-possessed people, you'll notice they don't like worship, not real worship. It agitates the demonic. 
We're not just singing praises. We are warriors reminding those principalities that were spoiled and embarrassed and in the victory parade, the ones that were being made a show of. Our worship reminds them they are defeated so they can stop pretending because we know better. Psalms 149.5 says, so let the high praises of God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand. This is what we avoid as love warriors. Almost done. We avoid spite and hatred because it absolutely will blind your eyes and distort your judgment. Ephesians 4.27 says, neither give place to the devil. The devil tries to pull us by seducing us. He wants our worship. The devil's always trying to get the world to worship him with the glitter and the power and the money and the lust. The other thing we have to do as warriors, we have to put on our armor. We are in a war. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 tells us, now abideth hope, faith, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is love. He wanted to model for us what he wanted. He modeled the greatest love of all. The Lord Jesus turned and the world upside down with his love. God is so good. Oh, how he loves you and me. There's nothing like the love of God. There's no love like his love. His love is eternal. His love reaches down to us in the depth of our sin and our filth. His love holds us and covers us and saves us. While we were yet sinners, he died. He didn't wait till we got ourselves together to love us. When we were in the filth of sin, his love found us. His love kept us. His love drew us. Oh, how he loves you and me. Hallelujah. us in the blood of Jesus. Help us to stop fighting in flesh and blood and using our natural weapons. Help us to fight in the spirit realm. You've given us weapons that are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. We can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. We thank you, Lord. We ask you to tear down strongholds in our lives first. And then help us to see that we're warriors. To put on the whole armor every morning. To get up. To spend time in your presence. To learn to worship you. To learn to love you. To minister our love unto you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Bless the Lord. I give thanks for each one of you again. And I know that someone out there um, may not know this guy that I'm talking about. They may not have had this experience with the living and true God. Or you might even have fallen away. Either way, I'm telling you now, that God's heart is so big that it doesn't matter where you are in life, what position, what sins you are involved in, committed in the past, and may even be committing right now. God's grace is bigger. And that's a declaration you can take to the bank. He can forgive you of your sins, and he has promised to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And the only thing you have to do is so simple that most people they just can't handle it. 
because it's so simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive him into your heart. Ask him to come. And the Lord will come in. And he will be at work in you. Like he's been at work in me. And all the other saints of the Most High God. And it's a blessing. It's a beautiful thing. To be in communion with the Most High God. Hallelujah. And we're going to celebrate that this morning. And I would hope that you would give your heart to the Lord so that you also may come and be in communion with God. All you have to do is say a simple prayer. Simple prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I repent of my sins. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And I repent of my sins. I turn from them. And I turn to you, God, and I ask that you would forgive me my sins, cleanse me of all unrighteousness, just like you promised you would. I give my heart to you, and I invite in the Holy Spirit, God, to begin that work of making me like Christ. So come, Lord. My heart is open. Come. Hallelujah. Thank you. Congratulations. If you prayed this prayer, or would like prayer, give us a call at 215-839-8121. Again, 215-839-8121. God bless you.